Today we're talking about the sun. It has virtually shaped everything in this rock we share from plants all the way to our very cores, giving rhythm to our circadian cycles. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone to know that it has also been shaping architecture since the very beginning, I would say. The relationship between architecture and by proxy architects with the sun has always been a very close one. Always, that is, up until fairly recently, when we figured out ways to simply not have to care as much about the sun without really having to pay for the consequences of that. I find that as architects, we tend to limit ourselves to simply knowing that the sun moves through the southern skies without really understanding the intricacies and the complexities of this movement. So today, in light of all this, I thought it would be relevant to review this relationship which I think has grown distant. Throughout this video, I'll be illustrating precisely how the sun moves and how we can track its movement. And I will then show a project we did that showcases why having this knowledge is so important when doing sustainable architecture. I was meaning to also address solar radiation, solar intensity and the impact of different facades, but I realized that if I did that, this video would have just been too long, you would have gotten tired of my face and you would have just ditched me. Now, I'm not blaming you, I think I would probably do the same, I'm just pointing out the fact. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get on with the video. But before that, intro. Let's get something out of the way. Throughout this whole video, I'll be referring to the movement of the sun in relation to a spot here on Earth. Now, I'm familiar with Galileo's findings. I know that it's us to move around the sun. This just makes life simpler for everyone. And this framework actually has a name to it. It's called lococentric view. It's a simplistic logic which treats the horizon as a circle with the reference point in its center. The sky dome is then a perfect hemisphere with the zenith being the projection of our reference point, which is at the center of our plane. Using this method, we can determine the solar position in reference to that point by using just two angles. We have an angle then on a horizontal plane, which is called the azimuth angle, and is measured clockwise from due north. And then we have the altitude, which is the angle if we consider a plane going through our reference point and the azimuth angle, that would give us the altitude angle. The zenith angle would be 90 degrees minus the altitude angle. We all know that the sun rises on the east and sets on the west. I think I don't need to cover that. But in order to understand the exact path the sun is making in reference to a point, we need to plot this path into a two-dimensional space. There are several ways to do that, but I'll be using here the stereographic model simply because it's the most commonplace. The basic information you have in this type of graph is the cardinal points for one, and then you have concentric lines going from the center out. These lines represent a 10 degree decrease in the altitude angle. So 90 degrees is the point in the center, that would be the zenith, and then you go subsequently 90, 80, 70, and so on. This is the same for every graph in every location. Now, if we input the information for our climate, which again is Brussels, Belgium, we get a lot more information. Now, I know that this looks daunting, but bear with me, it will all make sense in a few minutes. It's a lot easier to understand than it looks. Each curve that crosses east to west represents, as you might have guessed, a whole day. Here, for instance, you can see the sun moving in relation to our point during the longest day of the year, June 21st, which is the summer solstice. Here, the sun rises right before five o'clock in the morning and sets somewhere before 9 p.m. Now, let's look again at the solar trajectory for the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year, that is December 21st, and you can see that the sun rises shortly after 9 a.m. and sets before 5 p.m. Notice a similarity there? That's actually not a coincidence. Now that we got that covered, let's take a look at these weirdly shaped loops. Each loop is actually called an analemma. <laughs> and it represents an hour throughout the year. I know, it sounds strange, looks stranger, we're getting there. <laughs> we saw the sun move through our graph in two different days. Now, let's look at it for the same hour during different months. Let's say one o'clock, which is usually when I have my lunch. Pay particular attention how the azimuth doesn't really vary that much. This would mean that at one o'clock, the sun is basically due south, or at least very close to it. And it doesn't really change from winter to summertime. But if we now take a look at the analemma for nine o'clock in the 
the morning. Notice how in the summer it is due east, yet in the winter it's at the southeast with a significant different azimuth. Now let me take you back to one o'clock. Let's take a look at the 3D model from the side and see how this change from winter to summer affects the altitude angle. The difference is quite high. It's actually 47 degrees. We'll come back to that later in the conclusion. Now why the analemma has this weird shape? That's something I will never be able to explain as well as Spaceman Steve, so I'll leave a link to his video in the description below. Now that we understand better the movement of the sun and how we can trace it on a two-dimensional medium, let's take a look at the sun path diagrams for all 12 months for my climate, again, here in Brussels, Belgium. I analyzed this climate on a previous video, which I will link here in the description below. And in that video, we identified three climatic periods, warm, mild, and cool, which is what you see now in this graph. Now, take a look at the sun path diagrams for August and April. See how their trajectories are quite similar, yet August is clearly in the warm period, whilst April is still at the beginning of the mild period. So you want these gains in April, but you don't want them in August. Now for the practical example. Remember the graph I showed you just a few minutes ago where I made such a fuss about the 47 degree angle? You see, south facing facades are not just sought out because they allow us to get additional heat gains during the cool period, but they are also quite easy to shelter or protect from the sun so as to avoid excessive heat gains when we don't want these during the warm period. This graph only represents one analemma, the one at one o'clock. So if you're going to correctly dimension an overhang or a protection to an opening of some sort, you would probably need to dimension it for the hours between 11 and 3, 4 o'clock, depending on the climate, depending on the specific orientation and the temperature, and even the activity being carried out inside the space. And finally, you would have to balance all that with the design itself. Now, in our own project called Stilt House, we managed to turn the whole house so that the main axis was east-west, meaning that our main facade could be open entirely to the south. And you can see the impact this decision had in terms of solar gains and solar protection with this picture I took with a fisheye lens where I overlaid a Sampa diagram. Now that you can understand it, you can see how the overhang we did gives protection to this window when we don't want these additional heat gains. Of course, we we're lucky enough to have a site that had this possibility and we simply just took advantage of this. And now for the conclusions. Southern facades are great because they offer the potential, provided you're not overshadowed, of passively heating a space. But one of their greatest benefits, even in this rather cool climate, is the fact that they're easy to protect during the warmer months when excessive solar gains would imply overheating. By comparison, this is very hard to do on an east and west facade. Because of the difference between the azimuth angles, we would actually need vertical elements, which would be detrimental for the lighting environment inside the house and would also simply block views out, which simply beats the purpose of why the window is there in the first place. Now, movable, operable louvers or shutters, whatever you want to call them. These are great, but they're often expensive and even expensive ones tend to break down because they are exposed to the elements. And if they're inside, they won't work as properly. More on that in another video. Yet in some scenarios, they're necessary if we want to rake in all the benefits of the sun in our project. Because as we saw, solar angles during the warm periods can overlap with solar angles during cooler months when additional gains would actually be welcome. Now, thanks again for your time and attention. I truly appreciate it and I'll get to work now on that other video I mentioned before about solar radiation and the impact on the different facades and I'll be sure to post it at the end of this video and the description below once it's finished. See you! Bye!